Okay, let's kick off. As I said, thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to another Creditor Watch webinar, which we're running on a more and more regular basis at the moment. Today, we'll be looking at identifying illegal Phoenix activity. My name's Patrick Coughlin and I'm the CEO. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. So Q&A, there's um, a question box in your GoToWebinar control panel that you can use. So please feel free to put any questions in there that you have. And um, depending on time, I will try to get to them at the end. If not, we will certainly respond to you within the next 24 hours. Of course, we'll also send through the slides and a recording of the webinar today. The session always goes for about 30 minutes. Um, and as always, feel free to contact us at any time if you do have any questions regarding the webinar itself, um, any of the products that we talk about, et cetera. We're always open to chat. We're always open to feedback. So who are we? We're Australia's leading commercial credit reporting bureau with over 50,000 customers across Australia, made up of sole traders all the way through to um, the largest public companies in the country. We have a wide variety of um, products and features, a really an end-to-end -end credit management solution for those looking for it, or alternatively, we've got little bits and pieces that can fill gaps that you potentially have within your business, ranging from credit reports, an online credit application to onboard customers, um, analysis programs for you know, trade analysis, for example, um, and of course, we will get into solutions to assist in identifying and avoiding illegal Phoenix activity. So today's agenda, just quickly, we'll go through exactly what is illegal Phoenix activity. Some of it will be basic. Um, it's certainly one of those topics that is always hot, but especially in today's climate, um, we know that companies are falling over a little bit more rapidly than they usually would. Um, and we know that certain industries are being hit hard and they are often um, the prime suspects or the prime um, individuals and companies involved in Phoenix activity. We'll look at early warning signs, some best practices, um, look at company and director due diligence, and there's quite a variety of available sources for you as well. And of course, we'll do a really quick live demonstration of a couple of the products that will help you. But today really is about being, um, looking at illegal Phoenix activity, what it's costing the country, the economy, um, you know, the definitions of it and that sort of thing. What is the government doing to combat it as well? So a quick poll question before we get started, um, and I hope you appreciate the pun here that I've entered. Have you been burnt by illegal Phoenix activity in the past? I should see the poll now popped up. I actually probably should have put a don't know because I'm sure there's plenty of you out there that might feel that you have been, but you're not necessarily unsure, or you're not necessarily sure rather that um, it was definitely Phoenix activity. All right, another five seconds or so, and then we will cut it off. Okay, let's look at some results. So a nice mix here, 45% saying yes, 55% saying no. I probably expected the yeses to be a little bit bigger, maybe that, around that 70% mark, um, but that's good. We've got a nice mix of people with um, you know, two different experiences, but of course um, you know, the no's are certainly, certainly don't expect not to get burnt in the future, and it's always good to be able to protect yourself and understand exactly you know, what it is and what's going on out there. So thanks everyone for contributing there. So let's get into it. So why Phoenix? Now, this might seem a little bit basic for some. Hopefully, um, you know, we are learning along the way. So a mythology of Phoenix bird would die in a show of flames, then would regenerate and arise out of its ashes. So in commercial terms, something that's relevant to you, um, imagine new co arising out of old co's ashes. So an old company doesn't pay their bills, starting to struggle. It could be illegal. It could be um, legal, technically speaking. We'll have a look at that in a sec. Uh, the old company collapses, owing creditors, tax office, etc. And then a new company with a similar name 
very similar name more often than not. Often they'll have the same directors, same shareholders, same address. Pops up basically doing exactly the same thing. So think of that, that's where Phoenix comes from. So ASIC and the ATO until recently didn't have a, a common definition. Now they don't necessarily say this is the definition that they use. Um, however, they both have it on their Phoenix website. So I think this is as good a definition as we'll ever get between two um, sometimes competing government departments. So a legal Phoenix activity is where a new company is created to continue the business of an existing company that has been deliberately liquidated to avoid paying outstanding debts, including taxes, creditors and employee entitlements. A legal Phoenix activity itself affects a huge portion of the population, not just those directly like subcontractors, creditors and employees who are often left unpaid or out of pocket. Um, however, the broader community is certainly affected. Essentially, the government will have to um, subsidise outstanding employee entitlements through the, um, I think it's called the Fair Work Entitlement Guarantee, FEG, uh, or it might be the Federal Entitlement Guarantee. Um, essentially, there's a, there's a fund put aside to ensure that employees, for example, who are left out of pocket, either in their pay or potentially their super, um, they end up getting paid by out of the government coffers, which essentially is affecting every taxpayer out there. Um, but so too, the, the you know the, the competitive landscape is is tilted to one side. is is, is it's unfairly balanced towards um, those illegal Phoenix operators because essentially competitors uh, 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 cannot compete with the lower cost base that a Phoenix company operates under. If they're not paying their taxes, in particular, that's generally the main one and, and there's some big obvious ones that we've seen of late Plutus, the whole uh, payroll accounting um, uh, ATO issue that came up, well not the ATO issue, the ATO wasn't getting paid but there was the, uh, you know, the commissioner's son involved in that. The commissioner was ultimately um, you know, found not guilty in being involved in any of that but what we saw was a payroll company offering you know well below market rates to provide services none of their competitors could come near them could compete and ultimately the reason they were able to offer such low rates is because they weren't paying any of the payroll tax or any tax to the ATO so you see there a huge effect across you know the entire essentially population as uh, funds are either not paid or having to be drawn down out of government coffers to cover um, employee entitlements. They've um, also indicated that it is not industry or location specific. However, they certainly have pulled out a number of industries that are a little bit more prolific than others. Building and construction, labour hire, payroll services, no, no, um, probably no surprises there. Security services, cleaning, computer consulting, cafes and restaurants and childcare services. Um, so plenty of services businesses there. Common in regional Australia, um, we typically find that illegal Phoenix activity operates around mining, agriculture, horticulture and, and transport. There is also a growing trend out there of individuals and companies popping up who basically promote or facilitate illegal Phoenix activity and that's in the guise of being you know, company advisors, uh, shonky liquidators or restructuring companies who basically seek out or are approached by organisations that are heading south or know that they're heading south on purpose and they are provide, they're providing advice on basically how to phoenix their company um, illegally, um, start again from fresh with a new company that does essentially exactly the same thing, same assets, etc. So um, twofold the, um, the, the government is working to combat not just those individuals and companies involved in Phoenix activity at a, at a sort of director or company level, but also those uh, individuals and companies who are facilitating illegal Phoenix activity um, by providing advice. So as I said before, just to complicate things a little further, there is such thing as legal Phoenix activity. Um, so essentially, couple of points here, does not hold dishonest, dishonest intentions, that's the director. Failure is responsibly managed 
the director has complied with their legal obligations and acted in the best interest of the company and its creditors. Um, assets determined at a true market value. So when a company restructure involves transferring assets to a new company, acting responsibly could mean having the assets independently valued to determine their true market value. In the event of an illegal phoenix, typically what happens is the assets are passed straight over with no financial consideration at all. Um, and generally people are left out of pocket. Um, there's not a lot of communication that goes on company is quickly put into administration and liquidated with zero assets and next to nothing being paid out. So I put a link here um, for legal Phoenix activity example that's provided by um, one of the government departments. So let's have a look at the economic impact. To address the legal Phoenix activity, um, the ATO ASIC and the Fair Work Ombudsman commissioned PwC to measure the current impacts of illegal Phoenix activity. Now they did one of these back in 2012. Um, however, they've obviously learnt a lot from that initial report and over the last few years off the back of the Phoenix task force, task force as well that was set up. So they were able to be a little bit more specific and accurate, um, look into you know, other avenues and channels that they hadn't looked at before. So it's a little bit, the numbers have changed quite a bit. In most cases they've gone up got a little bit more surety around what they are what they are quoting in this um, in this report. So annual costs of Phoenix activity, um, annual direct impact of Phoenix acti of illegal Phoenix activity to be between um, 2.85 billion and 5.13 billion, so huge amounts. Cost to business from unpaid trade creditors is between 1.1 to 3.1 million dollars. No, that's wrong. That would should be in the billions. Uh, the cost to employees lost through unpaid entitlements is between 31 million and 298 million dollars. The cost to government from unpaid taxes and compliance costs. I'm not sure why they put it in millions. I did copy and paste this from that link at the bottom. 1.660 million. So some huge numbers there, as you can see. Um, apologies if there's a bit of confusion around the billions and millions there, um, but enormous numbers that are really affecting um, ultimately everyone as we touched on before, illegal Phoenix activity touches not just those directly affected like employees and creditors, um, the larger tax paying government, uh, the larger tax paying base is, is, is greatly affected as well. So as I touched on, there was a Phoenix task force created. Um, this comprises of 37 federal state and territory government agencies, including ATO, ASIC, Attorney General's Department, there you go, the Fair Entitlements Guarantee, that's what I meant to have, FEG, FEG, and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, so here's a little statement they have. We've developed sophisticated data matching tools to identify, manage, and monitor suspected illegal Phoenix operators. We support businesses who want to do the right thing and will deal firmly with those who choose to engage illegal Phoenix activity. And there's a number of um, implementations that they've had since the task force came along in 2015 and there have been um, what they would call impressive results. I think there's a lot more that they can do and, and they're certainly aware of that and they're, and they're, they're, not, they're not slowing down so to speak. Um, but you, when you look at the numbers, they're not enormous if we take into account the fact that um, what we have 50% of you today say you had been affected. Um, I think we've, at the time we had about 200 or 300 re uh, attending. Um, so already we can see that you know, there's probably a lot more out there than the 25 illegal, illegal Phoenix operators that they have prosecuted. Um, however, they have taken action as well against 12 registered liquidators, seven, 79 company directors, um, reduction in businesses displaying risk factors of non-compliance, which may lead to illegal Phoenix activity, and a reduction in newly created entities linked to confirmed Phoenix activity. Uh, the Phoenix Task Force Interagency referrals have positive correlations to identifying businesses potentially at risk of illegal Phoenix activity. Um, and the Serious Financial Crime Task Force is currently actioning seven criminal Phoenix matters. They have made contact with a huge number of directors, advisors, and companies to say, what you are doing is borderline illegal Phoenix activity, or we are keeping a very close eye on you. We know that you have got away with things in the past. It won't be tolerated going forward. So while I guess the numbers may not be huge to defend them a little bit after I threw them under the bus a little bit, I will say that 
the um, the fact that they have gone out and um, and notified a lot of these individuals and companies involved in essentially illegal phoenix activity has probably slowed them down or persuaded people to um, to back off or, or or cease being involved in those sort of operations. So there certainly is um, some great benefits coming through that we're seeing. Um, and in the past, Creditor Watch has had a couple of people from ASIC and the ATO commissioners um, come in and chat about what they are doing and, um, and the work that they're doing and, and the effects of that as well. So I hope to get them back involved in the future to update us on, um, on uh, the Phoenix Task Force and their success. So some new legislation that is, I checked today, I believe in with the House of Reps at the moment. So on the 4th of July, the Treasury Laws Amendment combating illegal phoenixing bill was reintroduced to Parliament. Um, there was some legislation passed back in 2018, I believe, and this is building on it again. It's designed to enhance the powers of liquidators and the corporate regulator to deter and fight the behaviours of phoenix operators. Um, there will be four main, four key points here um, off the back of the, um, the laws, the bill itself. So uh, the first one enable, they call them schedules actually. Um, the first one essentially enable liquidators and ASIC to recover company property that is the subject of creditor defeating disposition. So it's either been hidden or transferred. They want to give them the, the regulator power or the liquidator power rather um, to, to go and get that property back that has been moved so that it is not at risk of being um, uh, captured by the liquidator and, and, and ultimately sold off to pay off creditors um, and or employees. Um, the second one, regulate and hold directors accountable for misconduct. Um, essentially, we all, we all know that if you've been involved or burnt by um, Phoenix activity in the past, um, there are some key, key sort of events that take place. One is a director backdating their resignation. So essentially going, oh, we're, we're trading insolvent here and or we're going to illegally phoenix the company. Um, it's as simple as me writing to ASIC, you know, 484 form, changing the date of when I no longer was a director and it could be months and months and months later so that it essentially, they're saying, well, I wasn't involved when that, you know, that illegal activity took place. Um, the other one, which is classic, and it's a little bit of a mind boggler, um, essentially the director resigning and leaving the company with no director at all. Um, still struggling to understand how that's possible to actually occur. Um, the third schedule here is make directors personally liable for GST liabilities. Um, and then fourth, authorise commissioner to retain tax refunds, ensuring taxpayers pay any outstanding tax prior to be entitled to a tax refund, a personal tax refund. Um, they have made men, or the, 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 the people I've spoken to and various people who are following this um, have said they've expected, they expect the, to pass both houses without any issues. Um, I'm confident that it hasn't yet. Um, if I am wrong and you are online with us today, feel free to call me out in the Q&A section and I will correct myself. Um, you can actually track this bill as well. If you click through on that link I've provided, you can sign up, put your details in and you'll get updates as, um, as the, the bill moves through the Houses of Parliament. Okay, let's look at some early warning signs. Now there's plenty of them. Um, some of them are obvious, some of them are less so. So stick with me here. Poor credit behaviour, cash flow, and or payment performance. These are things that if you're in, you know, credit accounts receivable finance, you're probably looking for them already. Um, however, what you can start to do is start to consider, okay, well, that's a warning sign and I'm in construction and it's a family business. Um, you know, the dots start to join. That means that particular company or customer that you're dealing with um, could be more likely to engage in legal Phoenix activity than say dealing with a, you know, a public company. Um, similar named companies appear or have previously failed. So you could be dealing with a company, you look in Creditor Watch, for example, you run a search on the business name and it starts to come up with similar named businesses that are either active or, or deregistered. Um, it's a good way to understand or good way to identify and ask the question, hey, why are there so many similar named or why is there a similar named business company? Um, to the one that I am dealing with. 
Um, customer all of a sudden asks to be invoiced in a, in a new company name, big red flag. Um, director steps down, director changes, okay, you should be monitoring all of your customers. So when you get a director step down, resign from being a director, you will receive an email alert. That is important on, on multiple levels, not just from a illegal Phoenix activity perspective. Um, if you have a director's guarantee, you want to know if that director is no longer a director. But importantly, um, in smaller businesses, family businesses, what you will see is um, it might be a husband and wife or you know, father and son or two brothers. One of them steps down, leaving the other one essentially to be tarred with the, um, the administration that occurs, but it leaves that one who has resigned to be free and clear to go and ultimately start a new company in a similar name etc. So that's often how they do it um, or potentially a family member takes over replacing them. Okay, so they're really important and it is incredibly common how often we see this, generally in six months prior to um, a company going into administration. Um, not just good from a legal Phoenix activity, as I said, but also good to see, hold on a second, husband and wife team, why is he stepping down as a director? Um, not a good sign. Uh, director has been associated with failed companies in the past or has been bankrupt. Really big signs here. We know that um, anyone who's got a track record of being involved in failed companies is much more likely to be involved in failed companies in the future. Competitor offering goods or services well below market rate. So this is a fantastic, um, a fantastic indicator. Um, it's also a good way to ensure that you've got a bit of communication between sales and credit. And when I say positive communication, I don't mean sales just saying, just push it over the line, we need money in the door. You know what sales people can be like. Um, it's a good way to go back to them and say, hey, do you ever notice any, you know, any competitors out there offering services well, well below market rates or cost rate, for example. And the other one is asset sh shifting. Much harder to see, much harder to track. Um, but depending on how involved in you know, your customers' businesses you are, um, always something to be aware of. So some t statistics that I touched on before around um, you know, directors. So a director with a payment default, five times more likely to experience another one. We know anyone with a payment default against them has a, I think it's a, is it, they've got about 18 months before they generally head into administration. Um, so there's a high percentage of people with, with defaults that go into administration. So that's a good early warning sign for you. If you are monitoring that particular entity and they get a payment default against them. Um, a director with a court action, two times more likely to have another one. A director with a failed business is also two times more likely to fail again. All right, some best practices here. And again, some basic, some, some not so basic, some new hopefully for you. So when dealing with a company, Obviously, ensure the ABN or the ACN is valid. Check the company status. Check the business status. If it's a sole trader, trust or partnership, we call them unincorporated entities. You can search for those entities with Creditor Watch and check to see what is the status of those entities. Perform a credit check on them. Have they got defaults? Have they got payment defaults? Are debt collectors chasing them? Monitor the company. So they, you cleared the first three. You're going to get into business with them. Fantastic. Let's monitor them. They're nice today. How do you know they will be nice tomorrow? Still trading in a month, six months, 12 months. Keep an eye on them by monitoring them. And then one that's um, popping up more and more nowadays, it's a small world out there. People love to share information, particularly, um, you know, customers who have been you know, slighted um, or other creditors that have been slighted. Search online, Twitter is often in particular um, a, a really good early warning to start seeing, you know, dissent against particular companies who might be failing on, you know, projects, closing stores, not delivering products if they're, you know, an e-commerce retailer, for example. It's a really good way to, um, to get a little bit of a sniff of something that might be going wrong ahead of, you know, official documentation coming through the courts and ASIC, for example. Best practices, looking at directors or individuals, if they're unincorporated entities, um, investigate cross-directorship. So always have a look at what other companies 
is the director a director of? All right, you might look at a credit report, it's nice and clean, um, and you think, great, I'm gonna, you know, got a new new client here, sales would be happy, I'm gonna approve these guys. Have a look at the cross directorships. Have they got a history of failing businesses? All right, do they have a, a bunch of other companies in similar names? It's really important that you, you keep an eye on that. Form a bankruptcy search, so we can integrate bankruptcy information into our commercial reports. If not, you can run one-off ones. As well, it's important to see, are, has that individual or that director been a bankrupt or are they currently bankrupt? And another one as well, monitor not just you know, the company, the customer that you're dealing with, but you can monitor for adverse cross-directorship changes. Okay, And I will just show you something that I prepared earlier, adverse cross-directorship alerts. Okay, This is a really good example. Um, Carol monitors her customer, Electric Industries, and receives email alerts when changes occur. Carol also receives adverse cross-directorship alerts on the two other companies that John Smith is a director of. So he's a director of Simple Power and Energy Solutions. And what we're seeing is Electric Industries, nice and clean. However, his two other companies are starting to fail or they're starting to you know, incur adverse events, risk alerts. So by monitoring um, Electric Industries with John Smith, she's also receiving alerts when negative information against his other companies starts to come through. It's a really good way to get a feel for the corporate structure of the customer that you're dealing with, but also get a feel for the dominoes of that corporate structure. If they start to fall elsewhere, other than the company you're dealing with, you're actually gonna be aware of it, so really important. Having a look at what some of the cross-directorship information looks like, We've got a company here, Four Ounces Burger Company. Obviously, lots of adverse information, so you're not going to deal with them anyway. But if we have a look at two important cross directorships, you can see that the director has other companies he's associated with that have got payment defaults against them. Okay, by clicking through to that, you can then see that they're also in a spot of bother over here as well. So it's a really nice way to start to understand what sort of shape. Um, this director's corporate um, structure is in. From a bankruptcy point of view, um, we can see that no bankruptcy match against this particular director. However, we've done a quick search here on a sole trader and we can see that there is a possible bankruptcy match. Jump in here, we can have a look. We're dealing with the, the person born in 76 or 62, probably have their address. If we have a look at the report, we can see that administration details type is a debt agreement. Debtor put forward a proposal to creditors for consideration under part nine of the Bankruptcy Act. Creditors have accepted the proposal. So really good information to know before you potentially bring this company, or the, sorry, this, this individual sole trader on as a customer. So just a nice quick question there to pose to you. Remember, while an upfront check is important, how will you know if circumstances change on both the customer, uh, sorry, on both the company um, entity or director individual changes? So combating Phoenix activity, it's not about credit watch today, but obviously I will touch on a few things. So credit reports, obvious ones that I've mentioned, assess the risk of a company and identify any individual cross directorships. Monitoring alerts, receive notifications when important changes occur to your customers and director due diligence. Now this is new-ish. Some of you might be familiar with previous products that we had called Bankruptcy Plus and Cross Directorship Alerts, Adverse Cross Directorship Alerts. What we've done is we've put them together in a single product, director due diligence. So that will keep an eye on um, those other companies that they're a director of but also allow you to perform searches and see bankruptcy information on um, individuals, sole traders, trust partnerships, and also companies as well. So the way it works, as I said, you'll receive email alerts when the director of a company you are monitoring has an adverse action registered against another one of their companies. A couple of other things to consider as well, understand how customers are paying other companies using Datalogic Plus. So is your customer using you as a bank and paying their other suppliers on time 
or are they starting to slow their payments with other suppliers and that's potentially a forewarning to you, hey, they're having cash flow issues, time to start either getting on top of the collections, uh, reducing their payment terms down or potentially considering putting them on stop or COD. Um, annual data wash, always a good time to do it. Um, I find around end of financial year or calendar year, great way to update your database, ensure you're dealing with the correct entities, you've got correct ABN, ACN, business names, etc. This helps with monitoring and alerts, but also if you have to go to court for whatever reason, um, the first thing you're gonna need is the, to ensure that you're dealing with the correct entity. In the event of a liquidation, um, you'll wanna make sure your security interests are protected with PPSR. Um, we've obviously got our product PPSR Logic, for which we won an award for last month or the month before. Um, speak to PPSR Paul if you want some more information on that um, or get your account manager to organize a demo for you. And of course, the last one, the most important one, for me, register payment defaults. This will alert others to poor payment behavior. It's also great leverage um, when dealing with a client who is refusing or not paying their bills. Um, and what you'll often find is a default will be put on there. They'll get knocked back for credit. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, it might be in three years, but they will come back and ultimately want to settle that because they get knocked back for credit elsewhere. See something, hear something, say something. So if you're reading this and it's causing anxiety or you have a strong gut feel based on the information discussed that you're probably seen or seeing illegal Phoenix activity, um, the government has set up a hotline. So we've got the number there, 1-800-807-875. Um, or there's a form or an email address that you can fill out or email directly. This is really important. Um, the government relies on not just their own, you know, internal resources to, 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 to find, to locate, you know, identify illegal Phoenix activity, but ultimately you guys are at the coalface. You're seeing it, you're feeling it firsthand. Um, being able to flag it and get them involved, get them looking into it early on um, means that they'll either identify and, and, you know, bring them to justice, so to speak, um, or at least put an end to it quickly. And, and hopefully that helps you and others within the industry, because we know that corporate failures have a serious um, domino effect, regardless of whether it's an illegal, you know, illegal Phoenix operation or not. Um, when one company goes down, it affects lots of others, not just, you know, direct creditors. Um, so we want to stop it as soon as possible and stem the bleeding. So I do encourage you to um, use the tip-off hotlines if you can. If not, ask for question, ask the questions. You know, give them a bit of information, and they'll be able to provide a little bit of advice or tell you if they get a feeling that it is um, illegal Phoenix activity that you might be experiencing. So we've got a bunch of resources, articles here from our blog, and also. Um, I think we've got a nice uh, infographic there at the bottom, the road to insolvency. So a couple of really good resources there for you to read once we send this through in the next uh, 24 hours. Some government resources, these are really, really good. There's also one from the Attorney General that I missed out. Um, but I have put links earlier in the, uh, the webinar slides as well that you can take advantage of. Um, the government are all, are all over it. They've got some great videos to make it really easy to follow and understand. Um, if you're new to this, uh, for those who have been around and, and, and experienced it, there's some great resources for you as well. So quick poll question here, would you like to be contacted by Credit Watch team to hear more about anything that you may have heard today? Please let me know, I'll just launch that now. Don't be shy, happy, to, happy for you to say no. That's fine, I know we're all busy. I know there's varying ranges of experience here. Um, so yeah, don't be shy to put no if, that's, if it's not of, uh, of interest. Another couple of seconds. Okay, thank you. 
So that brings us to the end now. I will jump in just to see if there are any quick questions I can answer um, answer for you, but I know that there are probably quite a number that have come through and I'm also conscious of the fact that we have gone past the half hour mark. Um, sorry, give me a second to have a look through here. Um, Grant's got a good question here, but unfortunately I'm, I'm going to say no and I might be able to, to have a look prior to sending out the email and, and answer it. He's, he said, uh, the quoted stats show the dollar effect of illegal Phoenix activity and yet the action by ASIC, etc., was the number of matters. Can you comment on a like-for-like -like basis, i.e. what is percentage of number and or dollar matters which are actioned? Um, I don't know of, I don't know a, a solid number there, but I know that um, it's it's a small percentage of um, of actions that are taking place against a much larger number of illegal phoenix operations that are out there. Um, the one thing that is tough for ASIC and the ATO is one their resources. Um, it's also tough for liquidators as liquidators often don't have or won't spend, there's no point in them spending money on doing further investigations. Um, so it doesn't just, they can't pay themselves, right? So if they feel like there's a, a, an illegal Phoenix activity going on, um, they often don't have the resources from a funds point of view to actually pursue it any further than just uh, liquidating the company and, and, and ultimately deregistering it. Um, so I would suspect it's, it's on the low side of, of the actual cases that are taking place through the courts uh, versus the actual number of um, illegal phoenix operations or events or activities that are that are out there. Um, do you agree the ASIC investigative action should focus on pre-insolvency advisors? Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, whether whether it's the you know pre-insolvency advisor, if that's the correct term, I think you know that what they're getting smarter at is is labeling themselves as as different sort of advisors or, um, you know, they're, they're even coming in with, you know, oh, we're, we're compliance and, and whatnot. Um, there certainly needs to be more done there, but I know that ASIC and the ATO are definitely um, clued on to the fact that, um, you know, what could be a legal Phoenix activity turns into an illegal one off the back of shady advice that people are receiving. Um, one of the, I read an article about the new legislation that's come up that, that I touched on earlier um, and one of the downfalls or, or one of the things that people are critical of is the expansion of the safe harbour rules. Now that's certainly not saying that safe harbour isn't an important, um, important component. However, it has the potential to allow people um, to potentially get off Scott free, so to speak, a little bit earlier than um, than they should. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's probably a couple of things there, and 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 what's come out of all of this investigation for me, and and trying to educate myself further than I already was on on the topic is, you know, we certainly will have episode two of a series two of of um of uh, illegal phoenix activity, and and no doubt I will be getting um, someone who is a little bit more well versed in in it and and also giving you the opportunity to um to, to hear someone else other than than my my voice um quick question here does phoenix activity also affect employees or is it solely between businesses i'm um, sorry not sure if i missed this i, I kind of touched on it but i may have um i may have been speaking a little bit too quickly knowing that i had plenty to get through um yes it certainly affects employees as well as creditors um, you'll find that employees are often left out of pocket in terms of salary um, and superannuation contributions, for example. Um, so yeah, that 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 in my mind um, is a definite yes. It does affect both. Um, do you record and display data on failed companies and who their pre-insolvency advisors were and their liquidators are? Um, so yes, we do record and display data on failed companies, so you can see. If, what status the company is at and when those statuses occurred. So if you looked at a company that was deregistered, you'd be able to see essentially when they went into administration or were struck off. Um, 
In terms of pre-insolvency advice, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but you would definitely be able to see who the liquidators or administrators are, and that includes their contact information as well. So that's really handy if you're monitoring them or you perform a search on a company you've been affected by. You can actually get the contact details of their um, of their liquidator or administrators that were appointed. Uh, sorry, just having a look through here. Directed due diligence, is that available through Creditor Watch right now? Yes, it is. Um, we will be in contact with you if you indicated yes, you wanted to be contacted. If not, please do get in contact with us um, through plenty of channels that I've got up there. Um, let's have a look. Oh, look. There's plenty of questions here and they all probably take a little bit more, um, they all, all require a little bit more time and thought put into them. So I'm not going to go into all of them now, but we will get back to you. Um, if we can't answer them, we'll certainly put you in contact with people um, who can, whether they're lawyers or insolvency practitioners, for example. Um, so I do appreciate all those questions that were in there. I telling you now we will get back to you. So please uh, don't feel like I'm fobbing you off at all. Um, as I mentioned, some some reach out, some contact us um, options here for you um, and also upcoming webinar link as well. Wrapping it up, last, last poll, did you find today's webinar useful? I think looking at the questions, looking at the number of people that um, registered and signed up almost another record for us, I would assume yes. We will do another series, another follow-up to this. I think we could probably do three or four of them to be honest, based just on a couple of the questions and, and the amount of content that is out there. Um, next time around we will certainly get um, a third party involved as well. We've had a couple of people over the years who are quite passionate um, and experienced in this space. Um, so we won't um, we won't struggle to find someone. I'll just close that poll. So thank you. And ultimately, thank you for joining. I know that um, it's uh, it takes time out of out of your busy day or out of your lunch break or whatnot. So I really do appreciate you taking the time. I hope you did find it useful, and I hope it wasn't too basic for some of you. And and you know I hope everyone learned something. As I said, we will get this out to everyone so you can start to click on the links of the resources that we were utilising and the other ones that we've identified. Um, and please do keep an eye out for um, future webinars, particularly um, number two in the Illegal Phoenix series. Thanks again, everyone.